We absolutely love our checklists. We like five steps of salvation. We like biblical elder criteria for qualification. You know, there's a really a big parallel between our view of salvation and what it takes to be saved and our view on what it takes to be an elder. And the idea is, is that we have these checklists, these five things, or we have First Timothy and Titus that give us these checklists that like, if we can just like check off the boxes, then we're good. So I want to spend just a moment and looking at the lists and the pastorals on elder qualifications and share a few thoughts on how these things have been interpreted and applied over the years in my experience. Maybe yours is the same, maybe yours is different. I'd love to hear from you in the comments. And if this is at all helpful to you, I would love for you to hit that like button and let other people know that this is a video that's worth watching. Let's dive into the pastorals, starting with Titus chapter 1, verse 6. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. How many times have you heard that list actually looked at as a full list? Because typically when we talk about elder qualifications, it boils down to a couple things in practice. Not in theory, but in practice. We say, have they been divorced and remarried? Because there's this view on divorce and remarriage. Do they have one wife or two? Are they still married to their, their past wife and all this? Are their children faithful? And by that, we often mean, are there children who are still living in the home under the age of 18 still faithful and then we make like a caveat to say if their children are out of the home then that's not really under their control and they've just done everything that they can do it's kind of like infant baptism where we've kind of like adjusted some things to make some exceptions and then those exceptions have become the rule we would absolutely just shudder at the fact that infant baptism would be okay but we for the most part are absolutely totally fine with just making a few of these items the actual criteria for being an elder, which is again, divorce and remarriage will just ask somebody, unless it's a scriptural divorce, if their children within the home are wild, you know, ruffians, then that might ask somebody. But what about this, blameless? Wow, like that's a really high criteria. How about this, holy? How about upright? How about self-controlled? How about one who loves what is good? I mean, these are fairly subjective. Like when it comes to steps of salvation and elder criteria, it's like, are they, have they been divorced and remarried? Are their kids faithful? Are they, do those, how do you even measure a child's faithfulness? Well, do they attend church regularly? Like that might be enough, right? Well, not really. You, you look at this list that they're not pursuing violence or dishonest gain. They have to be hospitable. Like, have you ever had a conversation that said like, of these potential elder candidates, have, are these people who have people in their home? Are these people who host events for the youth in their home, do they love hospitality? They, he says they must be. Like if you want a biblical criteria for something like must is a very strong word. How about 1 Timothy 3, where he says, here's a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an elder or an overseer des desires a noble task. Absolutely. And I feel like that's been diminished in the last 50 or 60 years where it used to be like elder was a desired role for people to get into, and they wanted influence in the lives of people to be able to be a spiritual leader, and they aspired to that. Very few people today aspire to this like they did decades back. So he says, Here, here's the list. Like if you want a checklist, let's have a checklist, okay? Like if, this is the way I, I view things. Like once you pick your path, you go down the path all the way. You don't pick a path and go halfway and say you went the whole way. So here's the path of the checklist from 1 Timothy 3 above reproach, faithful to his wife. What does that even mean, faithful to his wife? Does that mean that they have to have a stellar marriage or does that just mean just don't get divorced, don't cheat on your wife? Like, does this mean that the elder is currently not cheating on his wife? Does this mean they could have cheated on their wife but they got things turned around? Like, faithful to his wife. Uh, that might mean don't be violent, and don't scream and yell at your wife, right? Like, again, the checklist boils it down to the, the, the smallest, lowest bar of qualification. We have to think about what these words really mean, what it really looks like in the life of a real person who is aspiring to lead people closer to Jesus. Because if they're not faithful to their wife, are they gonna be faithful to Jesus? Probably not. Are they gonna be faithful in their role of spiritual leadership? Probably not. They must be temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle. 
Do we ever look at the, the candidates who are these gentle people, who are hospitable people, who have people into their home, who are not quarrelsome, he says next, after gentleness, and they are not a lover of money. Often again, we say worldly success, success in the world equals success in the church. Successful business leader equals successful church leader. It's just not true. John Maxwell wrote a book called The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. I believe it was in that book where he says that if he wants to identify the very best leaders in his organizations, what he does is he puts them in charge of volunteers as a kind of a pilot project to see how well they can lead volunteers. And the reason he does that is because with a volunteer, there's no benefits, there's no paycheck. The only leverage you have in getting people to follow you is the fact that you are actually a leader. So people who are used to leading in the world in a worldly sense, in a business sense, do not always make good spiritual leaders because they're used to leading by dangling carrots out in front of people and motivating people in a very specific way to be able to get things done. And that way doesn't work in the church because the church is a spiritual family. It's not a business and there are no carrots to dangle in front of people to get them to do what the elder wants them to do, right? And so he says in verse four, after not a lover of money, which could be a problem for some who might be business savvy and wildly successful in the world, could be, not for all. It says he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. We've always just heard it said, well, are his kids faithful? What does that mean? Do they attend church? Well, yes. Okay, well, then he's qualified. He didn't just say that. He said not only do his kids need to obey him, but he must do it in a manner worthy of full respect. In other words, is he beating his kids up to get this this obedience? Is he being belligerent? Is he exasperating them, as Paul says not to do in, in Ephesians? Or is he doing it in a way that as you watch this person as a parent, as you watch this man as a father, is he managing his children, leading his children spiritually, discipling them in a way that is is worthy of full respect. And again, like in Titus, if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Must not be a recent convert or may become conceited, etc. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace. Has part of your elder selection process ever been to go to outside people to get references of people outside the church to see if this person has a good reputation outside the church. That's a qualification. Verse 7, 1 Timothy 3, he must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace in the devil's trap. Because now all of a sudden, you've appointed this person to be an elder because they were not divorced and remarried. They seem to be faithful to their wife on some level. Their children actually maybe attend church or if they're adult children, gave up on God, but since he can't control them anyway, then we say, well, he still qualifies. Certainly we don't think that this person gets drunk and they don't really seem to be very violent, but they might be a little bit quarrelsome in in meetings uh, and they might have a little bit of a greed issue. Well, that all disqualifies, like that all disqualifies. And now all of a sudden, because you ignored the, the criteria, you have installed someone as a spiritual leader of a spiritual family and community that the the outside world community knows is a spiritual leader in a spiritual community. And they're like, that dude's a rascal. And they made this guy one of the leaders of their church. Like, what's that church like? What is this decision-making process really like? And see, so even if you take the path all the way of a checklist approach, then take it all the way. And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm promising you, you would have better elders if you followed what Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, hands down. But we ignore the things that exclude the people who we want in the position. So there might even be like a whole sermon on elder qualifications, but then when you say like, who are we actually going to select? How often have you ever seen it turn out that no one got selected? I've never seen that happen. What I've also seen happen is sometimes people don't get selected because they say, well, they don't qualify based on these criteria while current elders also do not qualify on those same criteria. And that brings us full circle to what salvation and eldership, elder selection has in common is this. 
It's like we have these steps of salvation, but what does it mean to be a Christian? We have these criteria to be an elder, but what does it actually look like to be an elder? And what it actually looks like to be a Christian is to be someone who is conformed more and more to the image of Christ. What it looks like to be to be and stay in as an elder, not just get in. We get obsessed with the getting in. Like salvation, we get obsessed with the getting in. Elder qualifications, we get obsessed with the getting in. But we need to pay close attention with what it looks like with the staying in, with salvation and with eldership. It's vitally important that we don't just have a checklist to say, well, you met a couple of these criteria, we kind of ignore the rest, and then you kind of get you in and all this, but what does it look like to be actually be an elder? This is someone who is leading people closer to Jesus, and if they're not walking closer to Jesus, they're certainly not going to be leading other people closer to Jesus, and all of a sudden you have a whole culture that's not interested in leading people closer to Jesus. What you have is a culture of positional authority that was seeking a position to have influence within a, a, a body of people to be seen from a certain position of authority and power, which is not at all what Jesus said leadership looks like. Jesus said the greatest among you will be your servant. The, the first will be last. The last will be first. And Jesus considered equality with God not something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, it says in Philippians 2. And so at his name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Not every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to your eldership. And so what I see sometimes is I see people being like, well, I don't know that my elders will approve of this. Of what? Evangelism? Like, we seriously need to get permission to evangelize. I'm telling you, if if we actually follow the criteria of elder, all the elder criteria, like not quarrelsome and all these kinds of things, then we wouldn't be in a position where we had to ask elders if it was okay to do what the Bible said to do. How are we more concerned about what a human leader thinks more than what the chief shepherd, as Peter calls him in First Peter, what he thinks about it. Now, there's one more piece to this, and it's in 1 Peter 5. And when we talk about elders, this, this just so often gets left out, but he, uh, Peter specifically addresses the elders, and he says this. He says, be shepherds of God's flock. Here's the issue. Here's why 1 Peter 5 never comes up. We are obsessed with how to make decisions. If we're going to appoint an elder, we need to look at the qualifications, but only some of them, okay? And But what we don't look at is, what does life look like when you're an elder? So here's what it looks like. Be shepherds, not people of positional authority. Hey, the thing on positional authority, the only position is low. If you're a leader, Christian leader, the only position is low. The lower you lower yourself, the greater leader you become. The more you get out of Jesus' way, the greater leader you become. And John the Baptist, Jesus said, was the greatest man born of woman aside from Jesus himself. And it was John who said, he must increase, I must decrease. But so often in elderships, we see people of the attitude of, I must increase, and I'm not really worried whether he increases or decreases. Or maybe, maybe it's the idea of like, I must increase and he must increase too, doesn't work like that. In order for Christ to increase, we must decrease. When John the Baptist was going to baptize Jesus at Jesus' request, he said, I'm not worthy to do this. I know people who, who, who aspire to be in positions of Christian leadership or are in positions of Christian leadership would be like, I would absolutely baptize Jesus. Like, what a glorious moment would that be for me? And that's, that's, that's just not right. So you have to be a shepherd. You have to be guiding people on a spiritual journey closer and closer to the chief shepherd, who is Jesus. And here's how he says to do that. You're a shepherd of God's flock. This is not your flock. Although he says, it's God's flock under your care, not under your authority, not under your influence. He says, be shepherds in 1 Peter 5, 2, of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. What does that mean to watch over them? The way people view God has a direct influence on how they view being a spiritual leader or how they view being an elder. If you have someone who's convinced that God is watching over us for uh, to see if we're going to mess up or not, to throw us into hell, you're going to end up with a person who is watching over the flock, making sure that nobody messes up. And if you have someone who is determined to allow no one to mess up, you also have someone who is determined to not allow people to grow into maturity because the only way to learn to ride a bike is to fall off the bike a few times, right? And so he says, 
he says, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing. How many elders have we seen who just felt like they just had to? And if that's where you get to, it's time to stop because that you're not qualified anymore. If you feel like you must, you're not qualified anymore. He says, but do it because you're willing as God wants you to be. God wants you to be willing, but God also understands that there comes points in time in our lives when our willingness is going to fail us. When we're going to get so discouraged, we're going to get so down, and you may have to persevere through some of those things. But God wants you to be willing, but he also knows sometimes you just can't. And then he says again, don't not pursuing dishonest gain, eager to lead with sovereign authority. No, eager to serve. Jesus said, the greatest among you will be your servant. If you aspire for greatness in the kingdom, do not look for positional authority. Look to serve everyone. Look to serve the least of these. And then he says in verse 3, this one kills me in 1 Peter 5, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. I have worked around some tremendously good elders. The vast majority of elders have ever worked around just amazing people. I've also worked around elders and have heard countless many stories of elders who are, who are absolutely disqualified based on 1 Peter 5, 3. Not lording it over those God entrusted to you. He entrusted them to you. And you're going to lord it over them? Why? Because that's how Jesus acted? No, Jesus was lord and he did not lord over people. No, he did not. But being examples to the flock. And then he says in verse 4, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Verse 5, let's not forget there's a second side to this. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. And so because God cares for you, then the elder needs to be a person who cares for the people entrusted to their care, to watch over them, to eagerly desire the task. Mm. Wow, we, we have some work to do. And I know of no better way to start than through prayer. And if we're going to select leaders, spiritual leaders, we need to have a clearly defined definition of what spiritual leadership looks like. And the only way to define what spiritual leadership looks like is to go to Jesus and watch how he led, because Peter says he is the chief shepherd and overseer of our souls. So we are going to watch how he led and then lead like he leads, who had no place to call his own, no, no bed to lay his head on. Foxes have holes, birds there have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And it has to start from the bottom, which is the top, which is the elders. Not because they're in a position of authority and influence, but because they're trying to lead people closer to the Lord. And if they're not doing that, if the people under their care are getting further from the Lord, then we have to ask, why are they not shepherding the people? And before we select people to be in that role, we need to take a good hard look at what Paul actually said in, in Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3 and, and 1 Peter chapter 5, what Peter wrote about this, because he knew Jesus. And, and we need to take these things very, very seriously and not just cherry pick and, and, and nitpick and rearrange and shuffle things to make sure we select the people we predetermined to make sure who got in there. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Again, if you like this, just please hit the like button so that other people can know this, this video is, is gonna be beneficial to them. And uh, watch another video. I've got another video on elders I'm gonna put right up here on the screen. And I hope you'll take a minute to watch that as well because I think you'll find it beneficial if you've liked this one. And we'll see you again soon. Take care.